each of the clover sections. Um, and it, and it kind of goes, this is kind of my way of thinking when I approach these different plant conservation projects, um, you know, trying to assess needs and status and things like that. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start with, okay, what's the status of, of, you know, that particular clover in the state? What are the conservation measures um, with protection? Uh, and uh, with protection and, and acquisition and, and management. What is the research? Uh, life history, management needs, genetics. Um, and we're increasingly trying to work on um, seed banking propagation, introductions, and, and additional restoration measures with partners. And, and that's, that's a big part of why we're calling this meeting is to pull in all of those other um, uh, researchers that have those types of expertise. Um, so real quick, um, I know a lot of you all are familiar with um, the, the Kentucky State Nature Preserve Commission, which the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves used to be called. Um, so real quick, I wanted to give a little background of some of the changes at Kentucky Nature Preserves um, that has taken place over the past few years, just to kind of give you all a background of the different programs that, that we work on um, with, uh, with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. So I know there's usually a lag of time when I switch to um, different slides. Do you guys see the next slide? Already? Okay. Yes. Okay, so um, Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. So we're a state organization under the Energy and Environment Cabinet with an overarching mission of protecting Kentucky's natural heritage. And we take this pretty seriously. Um, like many state organizations, we administer various programs that are all tied to statutes mandated by law. So our, our plant conservation section, which was recently formed in 2019, uh, we primarily work on monitoring, management, inventory programs. We're responsible for implementing the Rare Plant Recognition Act. So you can see this highlighted, um, uh, uh, one of the highlighted uh, duties of the Office of Nature Reserves um, is to recognize, conserve, and restore rare and endangered plants. Uh, and that comes from our Rare Plant Recognition Act. So, um, there's lots of other um, different programs that we work on with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. So we're also the state cooperators for federally listed and at-risk plants. Um, and we are coordinating the uh, Plant Conservation Alliance projects for the state. But there are many other programs at Nature Preserves that we work on um, since our plant conservation, uh, since our plant conservation projects are integrated into our natural areas program, our natural heritage program, our heritage land programs, and our wild rivers program. So I'll give you guys a, a little bit of background on those different programs. Oops. Okay, so I know this is, you know, information that some of you all know, but it can't hurt to reiterate. Um, we are the state's natural area program for the state. We manage a system of state nature preserves that contain some of the best remaining examples of the state's natural communities and species. The majority of the states across the country have natural areas programs and many states work together through an umbrella nonprofit called the Natural Areas Association. So um, that group aims to bring together natural areas professionals um, to, together to support and communicate best monitoring and management practices for our natural areas. So we do a lot of prescribed burns and invasive species managements, uh, invasive species management on our nature preserves. So um, all together, you see this map. Um, we're involved with over 120,000 acres across the state. that has been conserved either through the work that we do or the work of our partners um, through our heritage program. So in, in addition to our state nature preserve system, we run the heritage land acquisition program um, and our wild rivers program. So our HLCF program is the state's acquisition program for conservation lands. And, and we work with a lot of partners through that program, purchasing state conservation lands, um, partners like Division of Forestry, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, 
state parks, county governments, and nonprofits. So the majority of, of conservation lands in the state have been purchased through this program since, since 94. So it's a, it's a really important program for, for purchasing key conservation tracks. So through this program, um, the plant folks in our section work on uh, inventory of plants and communities in these managed areas. And then of course, all the long-term monitoring and, and recovery of rare plants in these managed areas and also on, on private lands. So our unofficial goal with the Natural Earth Program is to have every species known from Kentucky protected through this system. Um, and we've made some strides, but we, we have a long way to go. So let's see. Okay, so we're the heritage uh, program for the state as well, the natural heritage program. We house the rare species and community data for the state and we work with regional partners like NatureServe on assessing conservation ranks and distribution of species throughout the state and region. Um, we work with uh, the Southeast Partners and Plant Conservation Alliances on, um, on ranking and, uh, and assessing conservation ranks as well, um, as well as, as um, state partners um, on those efforts. So we try to map, um, you know, through mapping, consistent surveying, analyzing, researching, we can better understand the biodiversity of the state and its status. So we work a lot on databasing, um, biological or data collection methodologies, um, standardizing the data that we collect. We have, um, more recently, we now have an online tool called the Kentucky Biological Assessment Tool that you see here. Um, and this is a online, I'll show you this. It's an online assessment tool. It's a self-service conservation planning tool that allows customers to submit projects and receive data within minutes. So we, we work on, on, on data exchanges directly with, with partners as well, um, but this is a, a great tool for you to, to get to, to get online and, and get, get data on, on some of these rare species and, and communities. So one last uh, 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 slide before we delve right into the Clover talk. Um, we work a lot with the Kentucky Native Plant Society. Uh, several of our staff volunteer in various capacities like leading field trips, organizing events and networking. Um, we work closely with uh, the Native Plant Society on, on Conservation Alliance projects, particularly in outreach, uh, volunteer building, and community building. Um, so the Plant Conservation Alliance is a new initiative that brings together all these different groups from public to private uh, to work on different conservation projects. And uh, our plant conservation staff and myself help to coordinate some of these things. And through um, Native Plant Society, you know, we, we've been holding some, some, some volunteer days and, and, and trying to um, in, increase you know, volunteers and, and, and community building, but we've also been trying to, uh, to create different grant opportunities uh, for students and also just partners to, to, to also work on some of these uh, projects. So <clears throat> back to clovers. Um, before I, I go into the details of the Kentucky clover and then pass it off to some of the other uh, facilitators, um, I wanted to acknowledge some of the previous work done by clover researchers, many whom I have learned a lot from over the years. So Nature Preserves um, has been surveying and monitoring clovers, particularly running buffalo clover for, for many decades. And, and our former uh, botanist and ecologist, Mark Evans, had uh, rediscovered uh, running buffalo clover um, in Kentucky in the 80s. And you know, staff from Nature Preserves have been involved in monitoring and management uh, of clovers for, for many decades. But I also wanted to highlight the work of Julian Campbell, um, who over the years has compiled a, a tremendous amount of, of literature on the ecology of bluegrass woodland communities and the various rare species within them. And on his website, he's got a lot of great um, 
essays and, and write-ups on various aspects of ecology of the bluegrass woodlands. I have kind of a clip of, 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 of some of the links to, to his website. So definitely wanted to acknowledge Julian. Daniel Boone, um, who has discovered make many great clover populations and always provides great insight into the life history of clovers. And then Norman Taylor, um, I know Jonathan will probably mention Norman uh, when he talks about uh, seed banking and, and, and propagation, um, but he was a UK professor that was instrumental in seed banking all of our native clovers and clovers across the world. So I was lucky to meet Norman a few times before he passed away in 2010. Um, I remember visiting him and meeting him for the first time at UK uh, to get seed, running buffalo clover seed from his clover bank for a propagation study um, I did in, in 2006. So we really appreciate all of the work of all of the clover researchers in the past. So we have three native clovers in the state um, and we're gonna be going over the, the current projects of those. We'll start with Kentucky clover since that's our rarest clover. It's a globally rare plant, G1. Uh, it's not federally listed and is trending towards extinction. So that's kind of why we have it up kind of front and center to talk about some of the conservation measures that we are working on for that. So just a, a quick background. It was discovered in 2010 by Joe Lacefield uh, in Woodford County uh, and then described by Dr. Vincent and Chapel in 2014. And Dr. Vincent and Chapel um, described it through the measurements that were made by four specimens of uh, two populations that are in the state. So it's, it's, it's most closely related to reflexum and uh, there's some, uh, you know, characters with the petiole and peduncle link that, that separates it from reflexum. It's uh, got dry, rocky, south-facing woods or its habitat. Uh, and then the understory has got this interesting kind of eutrophic mesic herbaceous layer that, that I'll talk about in just a second. And uh, like all the clovers, it's associated with deer, uh, animal trails, and grazing. And it's an annual or biennial. Um, those are things that we're still trying to completely figure out. So the current status, um, there are two EOs um, or element occurrences, populations that were that were that were that are known. Um, the first one I mentioned in 2010 that Joe discovered in Woodford County. Um, it was uh, a D rank when it was first found. There was 25 plants, um, and it has not been seen since 2010 at that site. We go every year. <laughs> um, it's it's kind of a a tradition at this point. Um, that site has a long cattle grazing history. It's a little bit flatter and, 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 the, and the community is a little more degraded. So the second site uh, it, that was discovered in 2012 by myself uh, was in Franklin County. Um, and that was a smaller population that was also a, a D rank site. Um, I think there was less than a dozen plants there. And a small population has existed there um, over the, since it was discovered. So, and, and that community is, is much higher quality. So every year we go to the Woodford County population. Uh, it's usually just Joe and I, sometimes other folks uh, join in um, and, and search for the Kentucky clover that we have not seen there since 2010. Um, the site has degraded a lot over time, um, but the Franklin County site, a little bit nicer. So we've been able over the past, uh, I guess it's been, this will be the ninth year um, where we take uh, population data. So you can see here in 2012, no, oh, actually there was only six plants and 21 flowers. In 2013, 2014, nothing. 2015, seedlings show up. 2016, you get adults. So you, you see this pattern that, that looks kind of like a, you know, a biennial um, a pattern of this plant. 
Um, and then there's there's usually at least from the two cycles that that we've documented so far, these you know it, it takes a year or two off before before um, the seed germinates again, and the cycle continues with seedling uh, to adults flowering and then back again. So um, this is kind of the life history data that we've got. Um, we, you know, there's not not we don't have much to work with. Um, with uh, with you know sites in 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 these natural areas you know just a few plants so we're taking data uh, uh, as best we can with what we've got so a little bit more information on the Woodford County um, site in terms of associated communities um, and uh, as uh, and species. The Woodford County site is, is a lower quality woodland. Um, the habitat is fairly, you know, common in the bluegrass. So um, the, the habitat didn't really strike us necessarily as something unique. Um, it was fairly, you know, degraded, long cattle grazing history, a little flatter, um, lots of invasive species. Um, we've compiled species lists. Um, uh, I've, you know, worked with Julian and, and Dan when we uh, go visit these sites um, to, to, you know, uh, collect specimens and, and create our species lists. And so we have a species list from that site, but, you know, I, I wish we would have put out quantitative characterization plots on this site a, a long time ago. Um, I've anecdotally have watched it really degrade um, significantly over, over the past 10 years. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the the the, the ash decline, uh, opening canopy, um, making the invasive species even worse, uh, intense grazing um, at, at at various times. Um, so so that's so that's the Woodford County population. And then we've got the Franklin County population. So this site is much more it's got it's it's very diverse it's it's very um very unique for the bluegrass um it was found in 2012 it's a little bit steeper grade um again it's more of a, a south uh, kind of rocky um south facing slope dominated by chinkapin and blue ash and cedar so a woodland uh kind of uh structure and then the the understory is really rich herbaceous layer so eutrophic mesic species so um, there's lots of conservative species at this site and it also um, contains um, a population of globe bladder pod which is a federally listed species so when i found this population in 2012 i was actually looking for globe bladder pod populations so um i'll take a undescribed species <laughs> uh, uh, um, while, while doing that, while doing those surveys. So, so yeah, I was actually looking for something else, which that often happens with, with biologists when they're looking for something else, they, they usually stumble into, you know, different, different things. So, um, so globe bladder pod, Kentucky clover, there's a, another state endangered plant here called Eastern Yampa paradiridia. There's lots of just more conservative regionally rare plants um, that occur here. You see some of these photos, um, Vernona castrum, um, uh, Stranthium. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's a beautiful site. It, when you go there in April, it's covered in, in, uh, in bear grass, <laughs> uh, Camassia, uh, really rich spring, spring flora. So it's, 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 it's a it's a beautiful site. So um, we are planning this year, since this also is a globe bladder pod site. We're setting up quantitative monitoring for globe bladder pod, and, and we're we're doing more quantitative characterization plots here. Um, and I know Will had mentioned FQA. Um, you know, we, we've we've been putting out these CVS vegetation plots on a lot of our nature preserves, and and uh, and, and we plan on on doing that. Here we've got good species lists, but they're not in a, in a defined quantitative area. Um, but even though the site is really high quality, it's 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 really um, degraded a lot over the past decade because of bush honeysuckle. 
So both of these sites are private um, and we have worked with the landowners to uh, you know, educate them on, the, on these resources and how important they are, um, trying to do purchasing of you know, properties or conservation easements. So far, we haven't gotten too far, but we do have permission to go to these properties and study the populations. So, so that's where we're at there. Um, so some additional site conservation measures. Um, I mentioned both of these populations are private. So um, you see here on this Google Earth map, um, this is kind of the right here near Keene is the Woodford County population. And then up here on the top part is the um, Franklin County population. And that's about a 15 mile distance as the crow flies between the two populations. Uh, they're both known from tributaries of the Kentucky River. And you can see here Lexington, um, lots of ag land besides for the, the ravines and the tribs and the, and the Kentucky River. So we're continually trying to, um, to do some additional conservation measures at these sites, like at the Woodford County site, we've worked with the landowner to, you know, change the grazing patterns. Um, we have um, recently last year, Joe and I put out some, some, uh, some fencing to kind of keep the cattle out of the area um, so that we can try to see if the clover is still there. The problem is every time we go there every year, the plants uh, seem to be grazed. <laughs> um, so trying to, trying to work out some of those issues. The Franklin County site, we've been doing some bush honeysuckle removal the past couple of years and, and we, we need a lot more work um, with that. So um, searching for new populations. Last year, um, we got a, a small grant from US Fish and Wildlife Service to look for new populations. And so our target area was areas around the known populations. Um, we surveyed many different sites. There's just so much honeysuckle in this area. So we did not find anything else um, even of quality at all um, within this area. And we're gonna continue with that project this year, uh, looking for new populations. Okay, so we have a need for additional life history studies, um, but like I said, we just don't have much to work with in these natural areas because the populations are either gone or just so small, um, and we have a need for more monitoring and management, but again, the population is so small. So in addition to the, the, the phenotypic description of this plant um, by Dr. Vincent, um, you know, it's a really rare plant. Um, we think it is trending towards, um, oops, we think it is trending. I mean, it, it's, it's a likely, likely candidate of federal listing. And so we wanted to get more research um, on this plant. Uh, and, and so we feel, you know, really good if we, if we recommend this for federal listing. So we worked with Dr. Rufel, um, who is um, heading a genetic project for Clover, and I will stop my screen share and, and pass this off to Brad um, to give us an update on the genetics, the genetic project for Kentucky Clover. All right, can everybody hear me and see the slide I've got here? Yes. All right, it's nice to see everyone. I haven't seen everyone and uh, several of you that I know in a long time. I used to be at EKU and two years ago moved up here to the University of Michigan. So I just tried to put everything on one slide. I'll just, I think I've got five minutes, right? Is what you wanted me to try to keep this to. So I'll try to be quick and um, just warn me if I need to stop talking. So Tara and I, several years ago now, um, Tara, kind of found a grant that we could apply to and um, from the Kentucky Waterways Alliance. And we also had some funding from EKU to try to um, place 
Trifolium Kentuckiense in a tree. And really, Nick, who's going to be able to join us in maybe another half hour or so here, he's in class now, he's done a, a lot of the work on this, um, particularly all the, the lab work. So we're hoping to submit this to Castania, you know, within the next month or so. Everything's pretty much done. We just need to work on the paper. Um, so the background is that Chapel and Vincent described this in 2013. There was a really good trifolium phylogeny produced by Ellison at all in 2006, but of course we didn't know about Kentucky NC then, so it wasn't included. And then um, morphology suggests that trifolium Kentucky NC is most closely related to trifolium reflexum, but morphology isn't always correct, so it could be more closely related to some other species, and we wanted to determine that with molecular evidence. So we um, basically put together a phylogenetic tree using three non-coding regions. So these are regions of DNA that don't code for proteins. They tend to be more variable and it turns out still not quite variable enough, but we have one marker from the nuclear genome and two markers from the plastid or chloroplast genome. Um, in the Ellison study, they used ITS and TRNL, but TRNL is really pretty poor marker. And so there was a paper by Shaw et al. Um, that suggested NDHA, if you're gonna do studies this, like this, NDHA is probably the most variable plastid, non-coding plastid marker that you should use. And so we wrote a small grant and just said, hey, we're gonna sample this suite of species and we're gonna add NDHA to an already existing data set from Ellison et al. So we sam um, Nick in particular sampled um, new data from three of these genes and one, including one representative each of the trifolium Kentucky NC population, one from each, uh, yeah, one from each population. And um, as well as, oh, the, yeah. So the, the results, basically, what did we found out? Well, these are all out groups here that aren't really relevant to what we're concerned about. We did find a, a strongly supported clade of Eastern native North American trifolium species. So Stoloniferum, Virginicum, Calcaricum, Flexum, Kentuckiense, Bahariense, and Carolinianum. So they're a nice clade, strongly supported. Um, they seem to be perennials. Uh, at least these are perennials. And then the annuals or bi biennials are a strongly supported clade. And Trifolium kentuckiense is in this annual biennial clade. And, but relationships among these four species, Reflexum, kentuckiense, Bahariense, and Carolinianum, these molecular markers are unable to really tell practically the difference between any of them. Um, so you'll see that these support values, even for holding the two kentuckiense, species together are very low. That's like getting a 50% on a test, right? You wouldn't trust somebody if they took a test and they got a 50%. So basically any number of relationships between these species are, are possible with this data. Not to say if you didn't get more data, that wouldn't be clear, more clear. So on the, on the left side here, you just see um, sort of these branch lengths are relatively meaningless, but on the right is a mirror image of this tree. And branch lengths represent the longer they are, the more of a difference there is. And you can see among these annual species, the branch lengths are practically near zero. So there's, there's really no genetic difference in these three, mind you, in the three markers that we looked at between the species in this annual clade. So um, while morphologically, it may be most similar, Molecularly, the verdict is still out what species within these annual biennial species um, Trifolium kentuckiense is most closely related to. Um, now you can always gather more data and this will change. And I, I actually wouldn't do more single gene sequencing like this. I would do sort of full genome sequencing because it, it's just gonna be cheaper, easier, way more data. Um, so you couldn't, for example, use these markers to look at other specimens from Tennessee or, or the EKU collection to see if they're Kentuckiense or not. You need more data. 
So um, that's the gist of what I've got. So I can, um, should I leave this up or should I unshare? Um, maybe unshare, um, um, unshare for right now. Um, we'll, we'll make that available to anyone that, that would like to, to look at that more in a minute. All right, so the jury's still out with genetics. Thank you, Brad, we, we need more data. Um, and then Mason Brock um, and Julian, Devin and I have been looking at CERNAC um, online. Oops, you guys see this? So there's historic populations um, that uh, that that I'll, I'll give a good chunk of that credit to to, to Mason. Um, found that Tennessee population in a historic pop, uh, in a historic specimen at UT, and then there's also one um, at New York Botanical Garden or um, at the New York Herbarium, um, I believe. Um, but they're historic specimens, and they do appear to possibly be Kentucky NC. Um, so yeah, like 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 Brad said, the genetic study we really don't have too many populations to to sample from, um, and and we really need to increase sample size. Um, but but the the new revelation of Kentucky NC reflexum in the inner bluegrass and Nashville basin. Um, is, is, is kind of huge. Um, maybe this species is in Tennessee. Um, we're looking into sampling these specimens and doing DNA extractions. And, and Dr. Uh, Melanie Link Perez at EKU has the specimens that were from Berea and um, at uh, UT um, at EKU now. And she is skilled with this uh, DNA extraction of, of specimens. So um, so we're lo looking forward to, to working with her and, and, and you all and, and uh, different folks on, on trying to piece this puzzle together, uh, get more samples um, for this genetic study, um, see if, if maybe, you know, we need to also be expanding our, our uh, search uh, in central, in the, in the Nashville basin around Nashville. Uh, so that so that's that's pretty huge, um, and I know years ago Mason Brock, uh, when we were really excited uh, for you know Kentuckians were really excited to have a, a new endemic species uh, for the state, and Mason kept saying, ah, I know that uh, you know it probably follows similar biogeographic patterns um, of other rare rare plants that are in the inner. Uh, Nashville or in, in the inner bluegrass in Nashville basin. Um, and so he turned out to be right. So <laughs> uh, Julian has his hand raised. I'll get to you in just one second, Julian. Um, I'm going to pass this off to um, Jonathan, our, uh, our seed banking and propagation uh, uh, specialist here. Um, let's see, stop share. So we've been working with, you know, th this plant is, is it's, it's trending towards extinction. So we're, we're trying to frantically seed bank it, you know, figure out how to propagate this thing, working on augmentations, introductions, um, and partnering with the Cincinnati Zoo, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and Jonathan uh, Kubesh uh, to, um, to work on, on, on some of these, these issues. So Jonathan, I will pass it over to you to give an update on seed banking and propagation. And then if you could call on Julian um, and Valerie to give an update on propagation as well. My pleasure uh, and shoot, what an honor. Um, so I guess it's been alluded to, but uh, Norm Taylor at the University of Kentucky uh, had a goal of trying to collect all of the clover species, the genus Trifolium globally. And he had been working at this since the 50s, collecting across the planet. Um, 
probably some of the best collections that we have seen of species, even during the Cold War. So we got pretty lucky that Kentucky has trifolium because uh, the man the man wanted clover. The interesting thing in terms <laughs> of clovers for seed banking and such is, number one, they're close enough to an agronomic species that somebody's going to take the effort to seed bank them. And number two, um, in terms of seed banking, uh, our native clovers here in Kentucky are some of the best represented of uh, wild species through the USDA seed bank system. So, I mean, just kind of prefacing with that, we got very lucky uh, that a lot of our native clovers have at one time or another at least been seed banked one way or the other, mainly by norm. Now for Kentucky NC, um, I do have good news and I'm gonna share my screen to show you, but uh, we do actually have uh, a seed bank event from Kentucky NC. And this is the USDA's uh, National Plant Germplasm System. Uh, you, if you're a research scientist, you can come on here and request seed and they'll generally give it to you unless you get them really angry. I've made some folks out in Washington state very angry at points because Hey, can I have dot, dot, dot. You have to be nice about it. But uh, this is PI 687281. Um, trifolium reflexum? No, this is actually Kentucky NC. Uh, it says it's from Jessamine County. It's actually from Woodford County. Uh, and a little bit of snooping with Brad Morris down at Griffin, Georgia, the research station there confirmed that um, this is a collection from uh, the Woodford County, Kentucky NC site. Why is it mislabeled? We hadn't given it species status yet. Uh, why are the collection notes kind of off? Uh, just because the site's so close to the county line. Um, why does it have so many missing details compared to you know, what you would expect for a lot of these species? Uh, Norm died shortly after collecting this seed. Um, so at the USDA level, I have repeatedly bugged them. Before the pandemic, they were supposed to do a seed increase 2021. They have 506 seeds. Uh, they're very good at telling you how many they have, 506 exactly. Um, but that has been pushed to uh, 2022. I have tried to request that they update the uh, species designation and uh, try and update some of these notes. Uh, very quickly, for those of you who are interested in requesting seed, um, this is the USDA's label over here for seed accessions, but this is more useful for our purposes. This is how Norm labeled, labeled his clovers. So everything follows species number 34, collection number 20. So um, it took me asking a whole bunch of his students to eventually crack the code on this. Um, in terms of the seed banking propagation side, there's a lot of secret tricks that nobody tells you like we figured out five ways to propagate stolen ifram but uh yeah we've got an official collection here um and then uh julian campbell's really been leading the way with uh the uh, proliferation of the species in research uh i have received seed uh, will overbeck got seed at one point uh tara's had seed uh dr vincent has had seed previously, and uh, Valerie Pence at Cincinnati Zoo has had seed. Um, in terms of those collections, there hasn't really been a, here's how many seeds that we have, here's how many standing plants. There's never really been kind of keeping any kind of uh, tracking on that across research groups. But the general assumption is that we have this undefined quantity of at least 500 seeds outside of the habitat. So compared to in 2019, there was one plant known in the wild to this 500 seeds, pretty good news. Uh, I recently started a batch of seed here at uh, Virginia Tech uh, and we're keeping track of that. Um, I mean, that's kind of the, that's kind of the, uh, the, big, the big gist right now. Um, the real goal of just kind of doing an inventory of what we've got, um, trying to correct the official seed bank entry with the USDA, which has been uphill. And then uh, I guess trying to get more seed going, trying to standardize propagation. Uh, at this point, I'm supposed to call on Julian and then go to uh, uh, Dr. Gantz. So I'm gonna turn it over to Julian and uh, we'll go from there. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, just real quick. Um... I haven't been growing the 
Kentucky NC much in recent years. I did grow it at first for two or three years and increased the seed a little bit and gave some to Terra, etc. But my main interest in the recently has been like Mason discovered those collections in um, the Haveria from Tennessee. Right before COVID in March, I was in New York in the Botanical Garden and I found a reflexum, under reflexum, there is another Gattinger collection at New York Herbarium from central Tennessee, the same period as what Mason found. So I, don't, I just wonder if, and there is seed in these old collections, is it possible there could be viable seed in those plants collected in the 1870s? Does anyone know if that's possible? It's Question. anything's possible, maybe. Maybe unlikely. I know Jonathan was skeptical. <laughs> yeah, I would I say it could be, but you know, you don't know about the um, what's going on, and you know, with the with the cold stratification and stuff being in herbarium, it might be dubious there. But I would say that clover seed stays viable in the in the uh, uh, um, seed bank in the wild for a long period of time. I just think it'd be worth, it may be a long shot, but it, it's probably worth taking a look. You know, we can maybe ask New York or, you know, get some sample out and just see if we can detect some viability in those seeds. I That's guess, really all I've got to say. Um, very quickly on that point is I, I actually held the Gattinger specimen from Tennessee. Uh, and I mean, you just look at the mercury on the herbarium sheet uh, coming from a seed quality perspective, that might be a bit of an issue, just depending on how that uh, mercury treatment was procured uh, based on how much was splashed on the sheet uh, that could be an awful lot and depending on I guess if the seed imbibed any of that or if it just got treated that might be an issue um, in turn and coming from like contemporary stuff uh, this seed does seem to require scarification really aggressive scarification to grow so I mean if we have reflexum collected in the last 20 to 30 years that might be helpful if we're looking at like stoloniferum as a similar example. Uh, and I mean, reflexum seed, I've been growing stuff from as early as 1978, successfully 100% germination just about. So um, that might be a more, I guess, alluring use if we can screen for these plants from collections made more recently. If we talk about reflexum, there's a lot of collections made by county agents in the 50s and 60s. So um, for all of you on the herbarium side, that might be kind of appealing. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Dr. Pence. Well, um, we have um, applied some of the same methods with um, the Kentucky ants that we used on the stoloniferum. And that was basically to scarify them, as Jonathan said, and we we sow them in vitro, in in vitro culture, just because that's, it seems to give us a better um, level of, of recovery. We get about 100% recovery with that uh, germination in vitro, and then um, can move the plants out of the test tube into soil. Um, we have a number of them in vitro at the moment. Um, we have some plants in the greenhouse in soil, probably about 20 or so, um, so we can just keep producing them. We just weren't sure how many to, to keep moving into soil at this point. We still have more seed and we could, we could um, move into that <clears throat> production scheme as well if it's, if it's needed, so. Thanks, Valerie. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just mention, you know, this plant is so rare, propagation and seed banking is, is kind of key to, to preventing it from going extinct at this point. And, you know, trying to refine those propagation protocols and, and increase uh, seed for the banks. And then also working on, on, uh, on introduction projects and, and augmentation back in, into, into those, uh, uh, into the one extant site. Um, that's something that we've been working with Jonathan on a, on a student grant that he got through Native Plant Society. Um, and I know that we're kind of running a little late right now. We'll take just a few more minutes before we pass it off to, to running Buffalo Clover. Um, but Jonathan, do you wanna just kind of um, real quick, you know, I mean, we're, we're looking at introduction sites that are you know, essentially our globe bladder pod sites uh, because they're similar habitat, but 
Jonathan, you just want to give a quick update of the study that you did? Uh, absolutely. And uh, I'll, I'll just quickly share a screen to the abstract page in case anybody wants to check this. Um, this research report I submitted uh, 2019 to Tara. If anybody wants a copy, I still have a very good PDF and I can get that to you. I put a blurb of it in the Lady Slipper, which is Kentucky Native Plant Society. Um, but I went out, my background is more forages. Um, I'm one of those people who does cattle management, things like that. Uh, and in addition to what's the species composition, I looked at how much biomass was out there and I took some soil samples. Um, the key thing to look for here is that we're looking at really good, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost perfect agricultural soil, which is why the bluegrass is not the bluegrass anymore, but uh, we, within this just really high quality soil, uh, standing vegetation, we've got these clovers occurring in measurably different uh, P and K rich soils with these little iron rich pockets. Um, and that's been kind of interesting. We also have this weird correlation of uh, low forage mass and uh, high soil fertility at these sites, which um, in terms of trying to maintain low vegetation with high soil fertility, that's kind of a paradox. So that kind of talks about the need of having herbivores. So this is just some more baseline data to say, yeah, there's some kind of biomass management going on at these sites. Um, and I did some things with a plate meter to show we could measure this non-destructively. Now, I think what Tara is wanting me to go to is the end here where I talk about, you know, what my recommendations are and all that, oh, pretty pictures, pretty pictures, pretty pictures. Uh, th this has all my raw data as well. So if anybody wants to look at this or double check it, you're more welcome. So, you know, looking at the Kentucky Clover recommendations, um, we, we have these choices between Jessamine Creek uh, Gorge and Camp Pleasant were proposed as like introduction spaces. Looking out there, um, there are some floristic things that make me lean towards Camp Pleasant. Um, and I mean, in terms of the productivity and such, there's just more biomass at Jessamine Creek. So based off of some of what we've seen in the habitats, I think Camp Pleasant's gonna be the way to go or the Franklin County site, if you're looking at the uh, notes here. So that's the quick and dirty. If you wanna look at this uh, research report, I will gladly send you a copy. I don't know how it's uh, put into uh, nature preserves, but uh, yeah, it was a really fun project. Um, before I, I pass it off to Mason, um, I'll just wrap up with some closing priorities for Kentucky Clover. Um, and then I'll call on Mason and then, and then Heidi will start the, the running buffalo clover section. Um, but yeah, basically, um, we're kind of desperate with Kentucky clover. Um, we're trying to increase seed, do these introductions, try to, try to figure out um, how to prevent this thing from going extinct. Um, you know, uh, site conservation, um, looking for funding for some of that genetic research um, that we want to work on with Mason and, and um, Dr. Link Perez. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's, a, that's kind of it in, in a nutshell. There, there's lots of different projects and collaborations that we can work on. Um, yeah, we're just trying to figure out how to do it all. Um, Mason, you got something? Yeah, I do. Uh, thanks, thanks for um, calling on me. I just wanted to give a few brief, and I promise they'll be brief, uh, uh, just uh, updates and thoughts on the Tennessee populations. Um, so uh, I guess it was, uh, none of the two specimens have locality data. So we don't know exactly where he was when he collected them. But uh, last night I was looking at other specimens collected uh, on Cernak from the same month. Uh, and it, we can pretty safely assume that he was in the calcareous areas around Nashville. And that would be the outer Nashville basin. And uh, just uh, from, from what I uh, have um, uh, seen in the herbarium specimens that I've seen, that is a very poorly botanized area. Most people botanize the cedar glades uh, east and southeast of Nashville. The actual, um, the more uh, mesic uh, kind of burr oaky type habitats are very poorly botanized. It could very, very easily still be out there. Um, 
And so uh, the two of the species that you mentioned that co-occur with it, uh, Pairderidia americana and Pisaria globosa are absolutely in the outer Nashville basin. I, know, I mean, there are sites where those things coexist. So, I mean, this is, is not on Tennessee botanist radars. We could easily find it if we looked. And uh, there is a third Gattinger specimen uh, located in Pittsburgh, which is not available online. And the first person who makes the drive to Pittsburgh will be the first botanist to get to see that. So uh, just want to throw that out there. <laughs> And also there are Gattinger specimens scattered all over the country and in other countries. In fact, I ran across Gattinger specimens when I was visiting the University of Tokyo. And so there, there is no telling how many other duplicates are floating around out there of Gattinger's material. Anyway, that's all I got. Tara, just a real quick comment. Um, I forgot to, uh -huh. to add this that uh, Tara actually put together a new key based on Weekly's key um, that we plan on publishing that Castania paper to sort of raise awareness of people going out and looking to try to find more populations. So. All right. Well, thanks, Brad and Mason. Mason's always a wealth of, of, of awesome information um, and uh, sleuthing with those uh, herbarium specimens. That's, that's really good stuff. Um, We'll continue this conversation with, with Clover and the future. I'm sure there's gonna be more um, meetings specifically on Kentucky Clover um, and all the different projects, but um, you know, different grants and, and fundraising um, opportunities are certainly things that we're gonna be looking into uh, to look into more of these um, research projects um, with the DNA in Tennessee and then looking for new, new populations in Kentucky and Tennessee. And then the seed banking and propagation. So um, with that, I haven't been looking at the chat. Um, I'll pass it off to, um, oh, Mobot. There's a question on Mobot. We work with uh, Matthew on a lot of different seed banking projects, but um, we have not with, um, with Kentucky NC yet. Um, we're trying to get our ducks in a row and try to figure out what we've got. Um, so certainly we can, we can, once we get enough seed, we can send some to Mobot as well. Um, and yeah. then, of course, it's always a funding issue. It, uh, Tara, there, there was one other question uh, earlier on in your presentation about um, monitoring um, using uh, vegetation plots. Um, Will had asked if, if we we're going to use Carolina Vegetation Survey uh, style plots to, uh, to monitor the vegetation for Kentucky clover sites. Yeah. So. Um, we are, um, you know, uh, we have been setting up those CVS plots in a lot of our other sites. We haven't been doing that on private land sites. It's mostly been our managed areas. Um, but particularly for the sites um, for Kentucky Clover that are also globe blotter pod sites, we'll, we will be setting up those CVS uh, plots to get that floristic data so we can do better floristic quality um, analysis. Um, so with that, I know this is where really packing this clover stuff in, aren't we? Or you guys are gonna, I don't think you'll get sick of clover, but you might. Um, but anyways, let's let's pass it off to Heidi, um, who's leading our RBC projects. Um, Heidi. Yeah, so hello, it's nice to see a bunch of familiar faces. Um, I'm gonna start off our discussion on running buffalo clover in Kentucky. Um, so we conducted a statewide assessment of all of our accessible populations of running buffalo clover in Kentucky in 2019 and 2020. And this was so we could determine um, any potential effects delisting will have on this species as it was proposed for delisting in 2019. Um, there were a handful of extant populations we were not able to get to for a number of reasons. Um, most of our populations occur on private properties, and it takes a lot of planning and reaching out to landowners to get permission to access their land. Um, also, because of COVID-19 in 2020, we couldn't knock on doors as we have in the past, um, where we hadn't been able to get a, ho a hold of landowners via telephone or email. 
Um, and then plus a couple sites, we were just denied access. But in total, we were able to survey 61 element occurrences over the past two years, which was a major feat. Um, we had the help from a couple other agencies and universities. Um, thanks to all of them for helping us gather this data. data. Um, so KDFWR, EKU, NKU, uh, Forest Service, and US Fish and Wildlife Service all were very helpful. Um, so all of the surveys that we conducted at nature preserves, uh, we gathered a specific uh, set of data, and that included a uh, number of rooted crowns, number of flowers, um, number of patches, patch sizes, as well as the associated species um, and their abundances and canopy cover. Um, before I get into the results of our surveys, this is just to refresh everyone on the specifics of RBC ranking criteria. Um, it's based on number of rooting crowns in a population, as well as the habitats that the plants grow in. So RBC's suitable habitat includes mm -hmm. music woodlands, river terraces, or partially shaded lawns, and it needs some degree of disturbance, whether it be natural or not natural. Um, so the results of those 61 surveys are varied. Uh, 24 populations were relatively stable, maintaining uh, numbers from previous surveys. 12 EOs actually showed an increase in population size and eight declined in population size. The four populations we failed to find um, on previous surveys, they were in the smaller range in the C to D rank. Um, and then the 13 populations marked as extirpated uh, were typically either previously failed to find or thought to be extirpated. Um, so we were just confirming that they were in fact extirpated. Um, highlighting some of our A-ranked populations. Uh, again, these populations were uh, had over 1,000 rooted crowns. The, in 2019, we surveyed uh, DARE properties. Uh, we did an intensive survey and we found uh, 1,769 rooted crowns. Uh, Lower Vitae Fork at the Bluegrass Army Depot, they had 1,148. And then in 2020, we surveyed two more A ranked populations, Scrubgrass Creek with 1,101 rooted crowns. And then last but certainly not least was the population along Upper Howard's Creek at Mount Farley Farm in Clark County. It had 6,330 rooted crowns as well as 1,496 flowers. So that was a really awesome find. Um, so here is our range map of our extant populations. Um, each of the different dots representing the different EO ranks that you can see up in the upper left-hand corner. Overall, our RBC populations are located in the bluegrass region with the exception of one population along Little Clover Creek in Jackson County. That's the plateau escarpment. And the highest concentration of populations are in the outer bluegrass, specifically up near Boone County and um, those in Madison and Clark counties. Um, I separated these maps just so uh, there was less overlap of the dots. So these are all of our extirpated populations. Um, there are 40 of them and they tend to be concentrated in the inner bluegrass where there's heavy urban and agricultural development. Um, and then as well as at the bluegrass army depot. Um, we don't rank planted populations as they're not naturally occurring, but here is the map of our planted populations in Kentucky. It definitely needs updating. Um, there are numerous other known planted populations. Um, we have on the map, it shows introduced populations that are at Shaker Town, um, Taylor Fork and Meadow Brook Farms, but we do know of other introduced populations um, including one in Boyle County and other various farms and proper, private property, properties in the state. Um, potential future work for RBC could be to reintroduce plants back into areas where they have been extirpated. 
as well as introducing new populations. So this is a map of all of the managed areas with RBC in or within one mile of the property. Uh, most of these listed have RBC occurring within their boundaries, but I also included um, other areas within a mile of RBC as they could be potential areas to introduce new populations. Um, currently, there's not enough management being done for RBC in the state, uh, with the exception of NKU's stream restoration projects, which involve removing invasive species around their populations. Um, and there have been work days here and there, but I think we really need to do more. Um, so basically, this map shows all the areas where there is opportunity to encourage and work with our landowners to manage for their RBC. Um, this would involve reducing invasive species, um, potentially thinning dense forest canopies to increase light through to the forest floors, um, and bringing in occasion, occasional disturbance regimes, be that mowing, trampling, or grazing. So overall, uh, we really need to focus on making management happen on these properties to ensure RBC stays on this landscape long term. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there was big news for running buffalo clover this year in Kentucky. Um, you may recognize the owner, Laura Freeman. She was the original owner of Laura's Beef. Um, now she has multiple other business ventures, um, including Laura's Hemp Chocolates and Laura's Mercantile. But I stumbled across this uh, EO in 2019 and realized just how, my, just how big it might be. So we did an exhaustive survey in 2020 and it turned out to be the largest population in the state by far. Um, the running buffalo clover all occurs along the bend of the upper Howard's Creek on terraces and music woodlands, as well as in cattle pastures. So the site offers really great opportunity for us to learn from it. We can, there can be studies done to, on the management effect of the cattle grazing as it has both um, areas with no cattle grazing and areas with it. Um, and then another great thing we did uh, last year, we worked with Laura to make part of her property a registered natural area uh, with Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. So as this is quite um, a unique site. Um, also, more exciting news was a population was rediscovered at Lower Howard's Creek State Nature Preserve, um, making it the only population in the state to actually occur on one of our protected state nature preserves. Um, and this population was found in a hiking trail that had been less heavily trafficked due to COVID-19. Um, moving on to research. Uh, Larry was unable to make it today, so I'll just uh, note some of the um, things he sent along. He is still continuing his research at Adair NKU site and the Scrubgrass Creek site at Clay W. May. Um, the numbers on the Adair property have been in decline ever since monitoring started there in 2005. Um, he attributes this to a decrease in the light reaching the forest floor, as well as invasion from other species. And overall, he thinks more management is needed for these plants to survive. And then additional updates, we will, I will pass this over to Jen Koslow of EKU um, and her grad student, Ted, and they'll be giving us some updates on their research at Taylor Fork Ecological Area and the Bluegrass Army Depot as well as Jonathan Kabish on the seed banking of RBC. Hey everyone, actually Ted is gonna give the talk because he was really um, on point to create the models that he'll be talking about. Not that I didn't have anything to do with it, but here I'll kill time by introducing Ted who uh, started working with running Buffalo Clover, what was it in 17 maybe, is that right, or 18? And uh, he worked with on it for um, a project as an undergraduate and for like for several years. And now he's a graduate student working at Lily Cornet Wood. So um, he's still working with me. He's just in the master's program. All right. Is that enough time? Yes, thank you. Um, all right. So uh, thanks for the intro, Jen. 
so I'm going to be talking about all the RBC P, uh, population viability analyses we've done. Uh, I'm going to be running through a lot of it pretty fast just for the sake of time, but uh, I'm happy to you know, obviously answer any questions or, um, you know, I can share my email and you can email me questions if you have them. Um, and so I'm going to start with the stuff we've done on the BGAD, uh, the Bluegrass Army Depot, and these are count-based uh, population viability analyses. So um, I'm just representing the geometric growth rate over time. Uh, sigma squared is the variance, and then we have the population size for 2019 and uh, the probabilities of extinctions. And uh, I just would like to focus on, on the value of these count-based PVAs. And so looking at these uh, EOs, 34 is more than twice the size of 56, and yet it's relatively more at risk for extinction. And so as uh, we obviously need to be efficient with our management, we don't have uh, unlimited time to uh, help every single EO. This helps focus down monitoring and uh, management efforts. This is uh, just showing the inflorescences and rooted crowns over time, but I would like to point out that like, uh, just, I can't speak for the 2003, but the 2018, the really low uh, inflorescence count is most likely just because we had trouble getting out there early on in the summer. So we think we missed, we simply missed it. It's not that it won't flower. Um, and then, uh, for those of you who might be, not be super familiar with PVAs, um, this graph is just showing the cumulative probability of extinction for a single EO over 50 years. Um, I just wanted to show this to highlight how crazy wide the confidence intervals are, which makes sense when you think about it, because even if it's a healthy population, if you have a few bad years in a row, a few good years in a row, you're going to get crazy confidence intervals. And that's why we don't use this type of data for uh, to say that, you know, in 10 years, it has exactly a 12% chance. It's looking more at the EOs, relatively speaking. So in summary, uh, these types of analyses are always good for helping us focus in on management. And I'm sure we're all aware of this, but uh, for exact numbers, you know, more than half the ESA are plants, even when everything that should be on there isn't. And then uh, they received less than 5% funding as of 2020. And these PVAs are called for in the ESA recovery plan. But moving on to the more advanced stuff that really isn't called for with uh, recovery plans for species, at least not often. Uh, at Taylor Fork Ecological Area, we did demographic or stage-based PVAs. And so these are uh, planted, it's restoration populations. And uh, this is clonal reproduction only. I'll elaborate more on that in a minute. Uh, so doing these demographic analyses are difficult for you know, simple life histories. Uh, running buffalo clover makes it uh, even harder because this life graph is just showing uh, regressions. It doesn't even show progressions that skip stages or fertility. Uh, so it's very messy and it's hard to keep track of, it's, but it is possible. Uh, these were some of the original stages that were proposed by uh, Ethel Hookie in 95. So just looking at them, obviously, you know, different stage individuals are going to contribute differently to the populations over time. These are those stages in, you know, in writing. We obviously don't just look at them and eyeball them and be like, oh yeah, that looks like a three. You know, we have specific criteria, but for the analyses we used, again, because it is uh, clonal reproduction only, we took out stage ones because they shouldn't be there. And then uh, we condensed stages four, five, and six into just an advanced stage 
uh, mostly just because uh, four or fives and sixes weren't common enough to populate the model on their own. These graphs are just to highlight that we've done analyses in the past to confirm that the criteria we use to assess the stages for RBC are valid. So we use total stolen length and number of nodes per crowd uh, per crown to assess stage, and both are related with the uh, number of offspring or the reproductive value. So the stages we're using, we know for sure are valid stages. And then we got to move on to the fun stuff uh, using R. And we stuck the methods and recommendations from Morris and Dirk's 2002 uh, quantitative conservation biology. So some of the important results. Uh, so the stable stage distribution is simply uh, over time when you project a species out so far, eventually uh, because like environmental stochasticity and everything can't really uh, shake up the stage distribution, uh, the model will converge in on a specific stage distribution. And this wasn't too surprising for the most part. We see stage twos and stage threes uh, and only relatively a few amount of the advanced stages. Uh, and then the reproductive value tells us the what those stages tend to contribute in reproduction. And uh, interestingly enough, again, this is just clonal reproduction, but stage threes actually are more important for clonal reproduction than the advanced stages, which wasn't really necessarily expected. Uh, and then probably the most important part that this gives us is uh, the elasticity matrix. And I have the important value highlighted there. So the elasticity, the elasticity matrix uh, informs us that changes in survivorship of stage threes from year to year has the biggest impact on population growth rate over time. And so, uh, especially with, with just limited to clonal reproduction, just survivorship of stage threes is what's more important, not the necessarily super big individuals. And so uh, just to sum it up kind of briefly, um, again, this is just focusing on clonal reproduction, which I know might seem a little odd, but to do these demographic analyses with seeds there is requires a lot more data just on uh, the seed bank and you know how viable every single seed is and it, we just simply don't have that data. And so the exclusion of that was important for the analyses. And then just harvesting the seeds from the restoration populations allow us to share those seeds for other purposes elsewhere. So there's benefits to it. So uh, stage three persistence and reproduction are the most important for uh, just the clonal reproduction if Advanced stages were, which are the ones that tend to flower, are the ones that do flower, were allowed to, like if we allowed the seeds to, you know, hit the ground, would be more relevant, especially for reproductive value. But for this elasticity matrix, even if we added uh, seedlings into it, I don't know if that'd be enough to overcome this wide gap in importance that the threes have over the advanced stages. Uh, and so eventually, if we know of, of specific management practices that somehow promote threes over advanced stages, uh, that would allow us to, at least if we're trying to promote clonal growth, would be good for them. And then uh, moving forward, there's always ways to improve models like this. The stuff gets really complicated. So better data on vital rates, seed bank information can always make better analyses. And it, I forgot to mention it earlier when I was talking about the BGAD populations, but I did want to note that the, with the BGAD populations, the, from observation there, the 
the, the, those natural populations that microstegium is probably the biggest threat to those. I've said just over the couple summers that I worked with it, I saw microstegium swallow up more than a couple plots. Um, but just some of the references we've used for all that. And then I don't know if we have time now, but whenever we get to it, I'm always I'm obviously happy to answer questions. Um, before we pass it off to Jonathan to give an up, update on some seed banking, um, and then we can talk about propagation for a, a, a minute. Um, Julian, you got your hand raised. Yeah, I'm just continually curious about, you know, the Bluegrass Army Depot was discovered by Tom Bloom and others back in 1992, I think it was. And quite a, a lot of detailed work was done from 92 to 2002. I helped with some of that. But I haven't yet seen really a synthesis. Obviously, the mass is a little bit difficult, di different back in the early first decade. But would wouldn't it be useful to combine data? From a population growth standpoint, we have combined data because that's how we <laughs> were able to make the population viability analyses. But I just haven't seen charts. The you know, detailed, showing... Are you talking about floristic analyses or what? The population, I haven't seen trends yet. I haven't seen charts which show the whole trend all the way from 92 to current. Is, are, are there some charts like that in some of the theses? Yeah, you must have missed that one. We also have a paper that went out in, it's been a while now, I think, 15 where we published the first PVA. Yeah, I have to look again, but send me the details. I, I couldn't find it recently. I was looking for those data and I couldn't find them. Um, Ted has a, I think he showed it, the trends over time. With well, back to 2002. I'm saying back to 1992, you know, the first. Oh, years. well, so Julian, that gets really complicated because there's different populations and different. Yeah, right. Uh, um, so it's hard to know what's like, how do you summarize data when some of them came from someplace, some of them were partial surveys, some of them have been extirpated, some of them have, so it's, that's why they. I, 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 for what it's worth, I think it was pretty thorough survey that was done back in the first 10 years. And I think it would be worth combining data, even though it might not be perfect. I think it would be worthwhile doing. Well, that's, I mean, I get that, but I'm just saying the reason we didn't include those in the EO is because like, as we find things or whatever, we're not, we're tracking different sites and different areas. And if you want to look at how a particular place is growing, then you need to at least be comparing apples to apples and not like apples and oranges. That's the only reason those long-term data aren't all included in the PBA. All right. Um, thanks, Ted and Jen. You guys have done some really awesome research, um, some foundational research for for RBC. Um, Jonathan, I was going to call on you to kind of maybe give a, a summary of seed banking. I know that we have a lot of uh, propagation um, that we really won't go into um, right now for the sake of time. Um, but you know there could be different groups that spur from from you know this that 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 delve more into that. But you know we we can grow RBC, we can transplant it. Um, we we feel pretty good about that. Um, but uh, Jonathan, if you want to give an update, uh, gladly. So in terms of seed banking, again, Norm did a great job about uh, collecting stolen Ephraim. Uh, I'll quickly share that again really quickly. Thanks to EKU. Um, I have uh, some of the seed here from Jen Coslo. She uh, shipped up some seed. So we have seed from 2012 to 2019 uh, from the Taylor Fork site, part of that preventing the reproduction by seed. So that is very handy uh, in terms of seed testing. We're looking to do some studies about uh, seed viability, seed quality through time. And we're just kind of lining up those projects. Here's the nice email. Um, really important if anybody's banking seed from these wild sites, 
uh, just putting down some of these details about uh, provenance or just where it came from, who collected it, what's their contact info uh, is crucial because uh, I'll just give this quick example. I've had to track some uh, stolen info down in the past. Uh, this is from my side of the fence. This is some work Norm did with Julian uh, back in the 90s uh, where he tried to make them all reproduce with one another. Uh, what do you know? Be, uh, this might be some validation for Kentucky NC status as if we can try and see if it'll cross pollinate with Reflexin. But uh, this is the one of interest, PI 516444, West Virginia, Rodney Barches uh, of this stolen Ephraim. And what I've been trying to do is just kind of track down where Norm got all these different accessions from, because we have some really good information from Norm's side of things but we don't tie them back to the wild populations they came from. So if we take this accession, we go back to the USDA seed bank, uh, it's S-232, that's stolen Ephraim, uh, dash one, it's his first uh, collection. He got uh, the germplasm bank out in 86. So this is near the discovery of the species. There's a quick summary here. Here we know how it got entered into the uh, system. So you go back to the original notes and they used to be these big published books, uh, about 1200 pages. And uh, it's from Norm Taylor from Lexington, collected by Rodney Barches, he got it in 84. So this is right near the rediscovery. And uh, I actually have it here, I'll uh, go into my email, if I can make my email go. Uh, and uh, shoot, I just forwarded this, um, here we go, 1984, running buffalo clover. I got in touch with uh, Bart just, and after all this hard digging, we were able to find out that it's probably from either Cotton Hill in West Virginia or from uh, this back fork uh, in uh, Webster County. So the application here is that we do have a lot of material. A lot of it is presumed to be from the bluegrass of Kentucky, collected sometime in the late 80s to the early 90s. Um, the USDA has been doing seed increases on some of these, so that's been good. Uh, they're doing that out at Pullman, Washington. But uh, we're still doing a little bit of hide and go seek in terms of figuring out where these come from in natural populations. So if anybody is doing any seed banking, absolutely critical to just get some provenance, some locality data, et cetera. Uh, I don't blame Norm here. A lot of these accessions were contributed and uh, he, he was mid work when he passed. So these were just kind of taken from his collection and then deposited into the germplasm system. I am working with two of his uh, former students, Dr. Cuisenberry in Florida, uh, and also talking with Glenn Aiken, who just moved, recently moved from Lexington to Florida, just kind of track how they divided up his collection. Um, so yeah, if you had had any actions with Norm Taylor, or if you knew anything about some of those collections, that's important. Uh, and again, just going back to that original publication of, um, it would be good to know these things. It would be good to just keep track of some of these records just for uh, from the research perspective. But uh, stolen Ephraim's looking very good. Again, very well represented. All right, great. Before we go into the last clover, <clears throat> um, I just wanted to mention for, for RBC, I mean, there's there's so much more work, um, you know, regionally that we could have pulled into this meeting. This whole meeting could have just been about running buffalo clover. Um, Jennifer Finfara, um, the Ohio field office uh, um, for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the recovery biologist, you know, as this species is potentially delisted um, in the future, I know this year um, and in future years, there's going to be more meetings, um, you know, coordinated by, by that field office um, moving forward. Um, but yeah, uh, Heidi, um, I don't know if you have any la la last thoughts in terms of where we go from here. Um, you know, we obviously at Nature Preserves have our priorities with what you've already highlighted, but um, um, maybe and anyone have any questions or, or comments before we move on to reflect some? Julian. Did, did Nature Preserves yes. ever put out a statement recommending changes or no changes to, to listing of Tholoniferum? Yeah, so 
we did we did uh, submit our comments. Um, you know, in, in, in general, we 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 did agree that it's trending towards delisting. Um, but but um, before that is done, we would like to see more ma uh, cooperative management agreements with um, particularly uh, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife WMAs and, and other managed areas. Um, currently, the only official cooperative management agreement we have is with Bluegrass Army Depot. Um, so we, we we just have a lot of work, even though it's on you know these protected areas. There's so they're not really last protected. Fall, last fall when we had the comment period, I never did see your comments posted on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website. Could you share your comments with us? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 yeah. Definitely. It's it's on that public forum. Um, yeah, yeah, I could definitely uh, I couldn't find it there. Know. I think it was late in the day or something. I'm not sure. I, yeah. Anyone else had seen that those comments that we put out there? I saw that you posted comments. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I'll I'll check yeah, again. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah, it, it basically says that same thing. Yes, in terms of uh you know, the grand scheme of things, it's not the rarest of the rare. Um, species, you know, for federally listing that we work on, it is trending towards delisting. But yeah, we definitely all need to work together to, you know, because once it's delisted, we don't have any, hardly any funding opportunities to, to work on it, you know, and, and even with the funding that we do get, um, we, we are working with a few thousand dollars a year, honestly, um, to, to, to try to monitor and coordinate management of, of like over 100 populations in the state. Um, on just a few me few thousand dollars a year. So, um, uh, so leveraging those existing resources is important. So there's lots of good comments, and um, Julian sent out some 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 drafts, and, and we'll compile all that uh, information. Um, uh, but uh, I, in in the sake of time, we're going to move on to reflect some. We really don't have too much going on with reflexum in our state, but Devin will kind of give you guys a, an overview of, of what we know so far. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, trifolium reflexum um, is our, uh, our third uh, rare native rare clover uh, to talk about for the day. Um, didn't put forth uh, a lot of uh, different slides for this because because uh, I was, you know, not as much to say, not as much uh, research, uh, but still fits into our theme of uh, rare native clovers. And I believe that, uh, I believe that uh, Dan Boone and, and, uh, and Tara and perhaps Julian have uh, spent a little bit more time looking at this um, at a number of our sites across the state. Um, and this is, a, this is another species that uh, requires uh, disturbance um, in a, a lot of places uh, across its range. Um, it seems to have a very like beneficial relationship with, uh, with fire. Um, so being that it is so rare and uh, prescribed fire is, um, is, is also kind of uh, sparse. Uh, we, we haven't been able to observe uh, the effects of uh, prescribed fire um, on, on this species, um, but it is notable that, uh, that similar to uh, stolen Ephraim, uh, this is a very wide range, ranging clover, uh, but uh, I think now I just checked nature serve and I think this is uh, currently ranked as uh, G3 uh, globally and is, uh, is listed as rare um, in virtually half the states that it occurs in. Um, so it, it is declining uh, across its range um, really for uh, probably a, a lack of the disturbance that it needs. Um, and the data set that I, that I used here to plot the reflexum populations did not include a couple uh, larger uh, location obscured records. Um, but it at least goes to show you that we have uh, virtually um, 
think it's eight existing populations and a number of those occur at uh, Mammoth Cave. Um, and then we have another population uh, that we consider extant at Penny Rao State Forest, uh, as well as land between the lakes National Recreation Area and Clarks River uh, National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so it is, it is good that we have some populations on protected lands and to my knowledge, I, I can at least say that we've we've uh, had conversations with uh, Mammoth Cave National Park um, staff as well as uh, Land Between the Lakes uh, staff with the Forest Service, uh, as well as some of the staff with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife at uh, Clark's River as to the um, just how rare this native clover is and the sorts of management that are um, important to to maintain um, viable populations where they have them. And uh, with, a, with a couple of these, a little uncertain about um, uh, long-term plans with, with management. Um, so we're just trying to uh, continue to work with, uh, work with folks to um, try and get prescribed fire management on some of these populations. Um, and Land Between the Lakes actually recently uh, had a, had a uh, prescribed burn on a population, um, I believe it was last winter, um, and it's, it's one that's, it's a population that's very close to another uh, federally listed, or, or not another, but it's, it's close to a federally threatened species, uh, Prices potato bean, Apios priciana. Um, and there was this large burn unit. Um, some of it burned over uh, the Price's potato bean habitat. And so really curious uh, how the fire affects, of course, the uh, Apios, but at the same time, it coincidentally burned the site, the only existing site in the land between the lakes that has uh, um, trifle and reflexum. Um, and yeah, the, <clears throat> we, we're not really, we, I guess like we saw like a small increase in the, in the number of plants there. I think it went from um, only three or four plants to like maybe three adults the, after the burn with uh, about a dozen uh, seedlings or rosettes. And then um, I think, I think Clarks River National Wildlife Refuge has some plans to, uh, to manage uh, their post oak flatwoods that have a pretty large recently discovered population out there. Um, and I haven't talked to uh, the state forest folks uh, or, or uh, Mammoth Cave staff recently, but uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done here as far as uh, there's a need for additional surveys to find new populations. Um, there's need for getting some of these populations seed banked uh, so that they don't uh, they don't blink out and go extirpated, um, but uh, but also uh, hopefully once we can get some seed, we can take the seed from uh, inoppor inopportune or inconvenient places uh, for management and put them into places that can receive consistent management, um, which I think is a an issue with some of the other clovers is, you know, we need to make sure it doesn't uh, go extirpated or extinct before we can collect seed of it. Uh, but then once we have the seed, being able to put it into areas that will receive consistent management, because um, just just like uh, trifolium um, stoloniferum, it's it's something where it just needs to be consistently managed over time. Um, so uh, a lot. A lot of lot of things are are, are uh, open ended here, um, and I'm I'm curious if anybody else has uh, any interesting observations about reflexum. But this is just my uh, my quick uh, bit about um, about this. I could talk for hours about it, but we don't have time. 
But <laughs> anybody who wants to check out, they go to my Facebook or Google my name and do a search. You can see a lot of different, you know, pictures and information about it. I have some 2020 information on Parks River. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm cu I'm curious uh, what you would have to report, uh, Jonathan. So uh, Mason Brock sent me out there kind of on a whim. So uh, I borrowed a friend's car, drove all the way from Nashville to Clarksville, visit with Mason. And then I made a visit out there. Uh, shoot, I don't have the seed packet in front of me, but uh, ju uh, early July, uh, just to go see the population that he was reporting on in Western Kentucky. Uh, I was supposed to fly out to Oregon the next day. So it's pretty fortuitous. I was complaining to Dan of all people on the phone and I looked down and there they are, uh, senesced and ready to go for seed collection. So I didn't get to catch flower color. Um, I took uh, seed from nine plants individually. So we have single plant selections for, you know, research and such. And uh, yeah, yeah, nine plants. One of the plants had seed heads, but failed to set seed, which was just kind of interesting. I don't think we really talk a lot about reproductive failure in native clovers, but when you look at some of the agricultural ones, it's it's pretty common, especially for Stoloniferous ones. Uh, in terms of seed quality, I actually started some starting January 25th in the lab. Um, observed an interesting seed priming effect from butanilide, which is the, I guess the germination promoter in spoke. So we did a butanilide treatment. Uh, seed was sitting there. Uh, I decided to. Uh, spark them with uh, scar some scarification, medium grit sandpaper. Uh, and the embryo inside the seed was already primed. And uh, within a day, we had fully formed plants coming up on the germination paper. Uh, I have about 120 plants in the greenhouse, uh, keeping track of who was mama. Um, so we, we have the, we have it kind of represented. So if we do a seed increase, we'll try and do a representative one where we balance out all of the parent plants, kind of capture the diversity and don't have it skew towards uh, the plants that really enjoy growing in the greenhouse. Um, I saw the nine plants I saw were on the edge of the post oak flatwoods. Uh, they were almost growing in the tire rut. Uh, some sedges, a little bit of juncus, kind of at the yeah. end of the habitat. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. There's, there's a number of, uh, a number of the, the cool plants that grow there grow in the areas with um, the shallowest uh, duff layer, like um, almost like they're preferring these small little microhabitats uh, where where there's there's not leaf cover. Um, and you, you see that with uh, uh, Centunculus minimus, this little, little, um, yeah, it's little tiny. Yeah, typical habitat in post oak areas for reflexum. Um, but it all depends on what, you know, the habitat you're getting into, whether you're getting into a rocky area I mean, it's very, really variable since it's the most wide ranging of the trifoliums. And I guess the uh, the strange thing is that I was also growing some seed from Dan Boone collected about the same time. Uh, and when you grow them side by side, Dan Boone stuff, uh, it just popped. It was ready to go. It was excited about coming up and germinating. So I think uh, we might be looking at some differences across the range in terms of dormancy requirements. That's Eden Shale type uh, material. So it all... Like I said, it's the wide, most wide-ranging clover in the eastern United States, and it, I, I would rather call it deer clover instead of buffalo clover. That's another situation. But people can contact me if you really want a lot more information on Reflexum because I've studied it for 25 years now. Um, I guess one of the my baby, one of the alternate things that could be happening, just given how uniform uh, Dan's flower color is on some of those, is there might have been a different selection in the absence of fire up near Cincinnati as well. Um, it just, flowers without fire there. It, yeah. it comes up just about every year. In fact, I'll probably be looking at some rosettes today. But I mean, when you look down, especially as you get into like collections from Mississippi, Georgia, if you look at some of the seed notes, you'll see there's generally a red, a pink and a white category. So not to say that flower color is the only trait, but there's some research that says that a simple Mendelian and yeah, the pubescence, some of the chevron. Really bad. But there's, there seems to be something there. But yeah, Clark's River is collected with uh, Tara's blessing. Uh, I can get that seed up to you. 
if you'd like some at uh, Nature Preserves. Uh, if anybody else needs to collaborate with Tara's permission, I have, um, I wouldn't say a lot. It's not like I'm sitting on pounds of seed. I just have, uh, I, I can get, I can get you if you're interested, I can hook you up with what you need. Um, life history wise, I think we can complete a cycle here in about 120 days. Um, so yeah, it was really yeah. interesting. I hate to have missed out on the mammoth cave stuff. I hear that that's Indian Hills is I studied that site for many years and that site persisted and flowered without any type of disturbance that's growing on the edge of the sandstone cliff. Um, I went 16 years down to Flint Ridge without success. And then after they did a burn, hundreds, if not thousands of plants popped up. Um, and that's a beautiful red color. So <clears throat> and then my my roommate, Joe, he uh, he found the stuff at Penaroyal. Um, a few years back. I don't know if anybody's ever got back there to look at that. That was that was really snow white color. Um, and I know there was an old mine area years ago that Norman had mentioned it was cream color. So you can you can have variability in the color. Uh, the stuff up at uh, Indian Hills usually was pink, the kind of pinkish white. Uh, the, the stuff at uh, uh, Flint Ridge was red. And then you can have some cream and white color flowers also. I did notice that the color and the look of the flowers at Clark's River looked a lot like the stuff that grows here in the Cincinnati area. So I thought that was really interesting for May, one of Mason Brock's original photos of that species, you know, that population. Yeah. I, I did mean to say at the USDA level, uh, Mammoth Cave is very well represented. In fact, we have a time sequence from every time Norm went from, I think, 76 on. Uh, and then there's one posthumous donation. I think Mason Brock was on that, or it's got Julian's name on it of uh, Reflexum from Land Between the Lakes. And I think it's got the site. So, um, yeah, um, that if you're looking for seed resources. Yeah, yeah, we need, we, we really need, uh, I really want to find, uh, try and find the best place uh, where we can, uh, we can introduce this to uh, either a, uh, heritage land conservation fund uh, site or or a state nature preserve um, so I'm, I'm definitely looking around for that so I'll, I'll let you know about any seed and, and Dan thanks for your comments and I, I know I know I, got, I gotta get out in the field with you sometime um, let's hope that works out you know. and I would like to look at those stolen yeah, so down, in, uh, down at the uh, around the uh, um, um, big bone lick. I know that that's getting tore up by microstigium and stuff. Yeah, so thanks for that quick overview of Reflexum, Devin. Um, and I guess kind of to wrap up a few thoughts of where we go from here, we're kind of running a little late. Um, real quick before I say that, I see Pat has this awesome specimen of of reflexum um in flower can you show that off pat yeah so um i've been working with jonathan with uh, the solaniferum and stuff and i got more into the clovers and researching them and stuff uh he gave me some material of uh reflexum but uh that seed uh poor germination it, it i don't know maybe i should have done a little bit more to to prep the seed um but we ended up finding a uh this is a Florida ecotype of reflexum. It's kind of not focusing. Where's that clearly. from, Pat? Where's that? Where's the seed source? Uh, I contacted the guy, and he said it's just some guy that randomly collects seed on his own property, and there's not really good. Um, no state. Uh, what state? Do you know the state? Florida. It's Florida. Oh, okay. Okay. It, it would have been northern Florida. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, what we do is we uh, we produce a lot of plants in the tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands for um, ecological restoration. Uh, unfortunately, in Missouri, they don't have um, facilities that really do the native plants for the restoration. So they outsource it to actual companies because the companies can make money doing it. And so we can uh, uh, really step up production on stuff. Uh, so I've taken the Reflexum and we're actually making this available because it doesn't have a, a listed status in the state of Missouri, uh, we're going to make it available to the public for people who are really interested in uh, looking at these clovers, try and get people hands-on with the clovers that, that previously hasn't been 
uh, offered or available to people. So they get interest and they learn more. And, and as we find lear learning uh, kind of leads to conservation. And in Missouri, we have a very successful uh, uh, native plant conservation program called uh, Grow Native. It's through the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And uh, yeah, so right now I think we have thousand a thousand reflects them well missouri's um, the first place i ever seen reflects them <laughs> <laughs> I, i've still yet to see these things in the wild i just i, I yeah, can't Arkansas find them in missouri uh I, niawatha prairie is a pretty good place that's the first place i've seen it and the flowers were cream color yeah out there. i'm hoping too with these little pink flowers it really appeals to people uh because mm -hmm. i think the missouri ones are all Beautiful pretty much specimen. white and bland yeah, I think so. you might have some. You got some red stuff. I know Ethel Hickey had found a population in Missouri in the Ozarks. One side of the road, it was white, and then farther down, it was red. So you had a mixed population of white and red. So that can that can happen. And it's a, you got red stuff in Missouri. I'll be on the lookout this year. Let awesome. me know. Keep me posted on Facebook. Yeah, we're we're just trying to go along, and I got all of Jonathan's uh, stolen ephraim and. Uh, Beautiful. We're just waiting until spring. I got to divide this. It'll probably turn into about 20 plants. So, but we're currently at about 450. <clears throat> thanks. Thanks. Quarts. So, yep. Well, real quick to wrap this up, because I know we're, we're um, running late. We, we, we did want to hear from Cooper, um, but we've kind of run out of time. Um, I knew this was going to happen. Uh, lots of clover. Um, <laughs> Uh, topics to, to discuss. Again, the, 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 the kind of purpose of this meeting was to just kind of update everyone all at once because so many of, the, so many of these clover projects overlap um, with the different species. So just kind of throwing it out there, who's working on what. Um, we'll throw out um, a, a attendee list of um, you know, different contacts, um, you know, our intent here, um, you know, with, with nature reserves and you know, working with Native Plant Society on some volunteer days is to just continue to work mostly focusing on Kentucky clover and running buffalo clover. Um, we would love to work more on Reflexum um, if, if we had more resources. Um, I know Mason, I want to hear from Cooper too. Um, and, uh, um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, Reflexum, like, like Devin said, is, is a, uh, um, there, there's still a lot more work um, uh, with, with with managing uh, agencies on, on on that species, but uh, we will, um, you know, between me and Devin and Heidi, will um, come uh, come up with some follow up uh, to to this group, um, and and you know some different projects moving forward, um, you know, and, and and come up with some structure to to update you guys on. Um, in terms of, you know, these different projects. Um, and yeah, there, there's a lot of need, you know, we, we don't have much resources uh, to work on these projects. So yes, we're constantly trying to figure out where to get these resources to work on projects. If anyone has any leads on that kind of thing, um, that would be great for research and propagation um, and introductions in particular. Um, you know, Nature Reserves is, is going to, you know, continue with our, you know, monitoring and, and trying to coordinate, um, you know, some management on some of these populations. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, all, all these questions that was just posed by, by Julian several times, that's kind of what we're trying to do here. Um, so, oh, my mouse just quit working. Um, so yeah, let's let's just keep this communication um, going, um, and and we will uh, send out a link uh, to this meeting and and with some meeting notes and some follow up. But if uh, anyone else has any other pressing questions, um, we will kind of wrap it up here because I know folks need to go about their day. Um, but any any last comments, Heidi or Devin, do you want to say anything? Can I, can I say one Does last wrap thing? Up? Are you, is that Jonathan? That's Cooper. I, I was just going to say. Oh, I said, Cooper, Cooper. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to mention Trefle and Calcaricum, but I mean, if, if Southeastern Grassland's initiative can be of any use for seed banking, it sounds like everyone already has that taken care of, all the different institutions, but we've got our seed bank up and running. And so if we could be of any assistance, we're, we're happy to do that. 
That's, that's great, Cooper. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of overlap with a lot of these projects with, with Tennessee and, and SGI. And um, we want to work we want to we want to work with as many partners as possible to try to conserve these these clovers. So so reach out. Let's let's get some projects going. Let's